Uh, it's chapter 8 in the uh, Aronson text, and it's also chapter 8 in the Gilovich text. So all of this is covered in uh, as chapter 8 in both texts. I think it's Arnett? Arnett, I'm sorry. No, Arnett is... No, it's the Aronson text. Okay. <laughs> I'm getting my textbooks mixed up. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. We'll talk about conformity, one of my favorite topics. Conformity is a change in behavior or belief as a result of real or imagined group pressure. Conformity tends to occur even in large groups. Is conformity good or bad? Well, it is It is bad when it leads to incorrect behavior, such as drinking or driving or doing drugs, because everyone else is doing it. And uh, an example would be from my own college days. Uh, there were, con there were uh, fraternities on campus, and the fraternities had reputations for being uh, slobs and for being academ academic giants and for being athletes and for being drunks. And, and one, one had a reputation for being uh, progressive as far as drugs were concerned. Well, the people that were, of course, people that were like that gravitated toward each one because of the personality of the, of the uh, institution, of the fraternity. Uh, but uh, sadly, even if they weren't like that, if they were, had a different personality, they uh, were still expected to conform. And sometimes it turned out fairly negative, especially in the in the drunk one and the and the drug one. Uh, the drug uh, uh, fraternity uh, was shut down because of the drugs. But the heavy drinking, what did they drink? Rolling Rock beer was <laughs> was big. It was weird. Rolling Rock beer is from Pennsylvania. Well, Pennsylvania is what two two states away from Indiana where we were and we were on the western edge of Indiana so that was a long trip just to get beer anyway yeah so sometimes it can be bad uh, it is good when it maintains necessary socially uh, organize social organizations such as waiting your turn in, in a grocery store checkout line and sometimes of course it's inconsequential doing what everybody else does in Western cultures, conformity is considered to be negative. It shows submission and compliance. In Eastern cultures, conformity is seen as a positive thing. Communal sensitivity, responsiveness, cooperative team play. One of the longest running and most successful advertising campaigns in the American history features the Bar Marlboro Man. People who have uh, never seen a horse, let alone American West, have responded for half a century to the simple evocative image of the Marl Marlboro Man. So, you know, well, I've never ridden a horse. I've, I've lived in Montana and Texas and Oklahoma and Nebraska and Iowa, Mississippi, California, Ohio, <laughs> Japan, Germany. Um, and of course, this this image is very popular. It's basically it's strangely popular in Germany, um, uh, as are American Indians. They they're just gaga over American Indians in Germany. They'll have uh, uh, retreats in the in the summertime, and everybody will dress up like like American Indians and wear whatever regalia they've got, and they'll wander around and. It's really kind of strange because um, what they're responding to is a, is a book written in in that area of the country. I mean, in uh, it was a German author who wrote it uh, at the turn of the 20th century, and uh, that's what they're responding to. Well, they've made movies about uh, some of his books, and they're really strange. I mean, they're really weird. <laughs> You'll have a confederation of <laughs> of Sioux, Cheyenne, and Comanche uh, attacking, you know, this small fort, uh, as weird as that is. Anyway, it's really kind of odd. I'm trying to think what his name is. Uh, anyway, yeah, Germans really like the Marlboro Man. Clearly, it tells us something about ourselves uh, that we want to uh, and, and like to hear, that we make up uh, our own minds, that we're not spineless, weak conformists, 
and that we're not puppets, but players. And of course, that's what the Marlboro Man represents. Doesn't button his, his jacket. <clears throat> there you go. And whatever whatever clothes he wears, that's what uh, that's what people start wearing around the around the world. As weird as that is, that denim jacket is extremely popular. He doesn't have any of his buttons, but that's not buttoned, and that's not buttoned. Hmm. Anyway, uh, under strong social pressure, individuals will conform to the group even when this means doing something immoral. In 2004, American soldiers degrading abuse of his, uh, Iraqis held at the Abu Ghraib prison sparked an international scandal and a great deal of soul-searching back home. And, of course, the pictures that came out of that uh, really caused a lot of, uh, of, of interesting conversations. Two types of conformity are compliance and acceptance. Compliance is conformity that involves publicly acting in accord with social pressure while they privately uh, disagree. That's compliance. Obedience is acting in accord with a direct order. Acceptance is conformity that involves both acting and believing in accord with social pressure. People may conform to a group for one of, of two reasons. Normative influence, conformity is based on the individual's desire to be accepted and avoid rejection of the group, going along with the crowd, that's normative influence. And informational influence, conformity is based on in, uh, the individual's acceptance of reality provided by other people. Wanting to be correct and accepting someone else's opinion as more knowledgeable. And of course, this is how politics primarily works as informational influence. Through informational influence, people uh, get information from, from uh, other individuals, not usually from the source. Uh, we can't be around our politicians all the time, and I'm not exactly sure we would want to be. <laughs> anyway. Uh, in the middle of the 1930s, uh, Musafer Sharif uh, conducted the first psychological studies on conformity at Columbia University. Now, this was uh, this was in between the wars, uh, and and uh, we talk a lot about in between the wars. What we're talking about is between World War One and World War Two. And one of the things that happened between World War One and World War Two uh, is that the royal families um, lost a lot of their influence. Uh, before World War uh, Before World War One, uh, royal families pretty much ran just about uh, every country in Europe, uh, except for France. England had a royal family, Spain had a royal family, Greece, Italy, uh, Germany, um, all the Scandinavian countries had royal families. And so they, they primarily ran things. After World War I, uh, the, uh, the uh, monarchies uh, didn't completely collapse, but uh, Germany lost their, their monarch. Um, Spain would it, it would lose its monarch. Uh, Italy lost its no. Italy didn't lose its monarch. Yeah, Italy lost its monarch to Mussolini. Uh, Greece still had a monarch. The Scandinavian countries still had monarchs, but uh, they were moving toward a more liberal type of government. That's what was going on in the 1930s. Uh, the more and some of them were accepting democracy. Uh, some countries had uh, social uh, had uh, social democracy. Uh, others were moving even farther to the right uh, to uh, uh, fascism, and of course Mussolini was a fascist, and uh, uh, Hitler, of course. Uh, and some of the the leaders in the the uh, Eastern Europe. Anyway, that's what was going on in the 1930s. So there was a, this huge upheaval. So the the idea was, the idea was that we needed to find out, or what they were looking for at Columbia University was to see how strong conformity was, uh, because it looked like uh, things were going to blow up again. Uh, there were no more royal uh, monarchies that had uh, the control over people that they could dictate what was going to happen. 
so that it was it was a um, a new movement, a, a a new social movement that was taking place. Uh, democracies, social democracies, and uh, and fascist uh, and communism, of course, was was uh, uh, taken over in uh, in Russia in the new Soviet Union. Okay, so that's what was going on in the 1930s. Uh, so Sharif decided that he would uh, he would see how strong con conformity was. Sharif had three people uh, make speculations about the movement of a light and dark in a darkened room. The next day, the three were put in the same room. By the end of the day, though their initial estimates were very different, they all agreed to a group norm. So conformity uh, took over um, in, in that experiment. Robert Jacobs and Donald Campbell from Northwestern University repeated the experiment, but used a confederate to overestimate the movement of the light. The light wasn't actually moving at all, uh, but was a phenomenon known as autokinetic phenomenon. The reality is that if you're looking at a fixed light in the dark, uh, your head moves enough, and with saccadic eye movement, it looks like the light is moving, if, you're, if you don't understand what you're looking at. It's called autokinetic phenom the autokinetic phenomenon, but he got them to all agree uh, to the same thing. The experiment is used the Confederate to plant the idea of movement, and the idea persisted over five generations of participants. Suggestibility is a powerful force. Researchers discovered fairly quickly that people tended to conform when they felt incompetent. Group uh, attributes that matter. Conformity is highest when a group has three or more uh, people. Uh, when there is a group, when there is group cohesiveness, if uh, they're all friends uh, or they all know each other. Uh, when the group is unanimous, uh, when the group is high in status, when the response is not public, when the group has made no prior commitment. That's when conformity is the strongest. Other researchers have done work with suggestibility. Peter Totterdell uh, has identified a phenomenon referred to as mood linkage, where people who work together tend to reflect each other's moods. Tanya Chartrand and John Barg uh, conducted experiments where they had a confederate making select gestures such as nose rubbing or foot bouncing. The subject tended to, to copy the confederate's movements in a response they referred to as the chameleon effect. And you can try this uh, at home uh, yourself. <laughs> and, and it was really weird because I've been in meetings uh, playing this game where I would scratch my head and then everybody else would scratch their heads. Or I'd put my hand on my face and everybody else would put their hand on their face. It was really kind of weird. It's like a mirror image. Um, sometimes people think that uh, that uh, that's, there's something on their face and you're trying to, to, to signal them that they need to rub their face. It's really kind of weird. Anyway, that's known as a chameleon effect. Suggestibility is not always harmless. It is not uncommon for people to get ideas from what other people do. Copycat murders, uh, hijackings, UFO sightings, even suicides tend to occur in waves. After Marilyn Monroe's suicide in 1963, the number of suicides in the United States increased by 12%. Mass delusions are not imaginary. However, the circumstance usually involves people responding to otherwise overlooked symptoms. Uh, so the, uh, they weren't committing suicide because she committed suicide. They weren't killing themselves because they missed uh, Marilyn Monroe. They killed themselves because it gave them the idea. And since they were leaning in that direction anyway, they went ahead and committed suicide. Solomon Ash conducted several experiments in the 1950s dealing with the pressure of the group. <clears throat> okay, so we have uh, in between the wars, uh, they were worried about uh, what, what's going to happen, uh, how, are, how is our politics going to fit together, uh, can people get along? And then in the 1950s, after World, World War II, of course, we were looking at, we're looking back and trying to figure out how in the world the, the uh, Nazis got away with all the stuff that they did, and why in the world would uh, so many people, 
follow these strange ideas. And so that's what one of the reasons that we were looking for group, uh, we were looking at group pressure. Uh, when they they tried some of the Nazi uh, war criminals, uh, one of the things they said, we were just following orders. We were just being obedient. And so the question had to be, what? how much pressure can the group put on someone? Ash conducted experiments where all the participants but one were Confederates. After a series of obvious group agreements, the group purposely, purposely all select an obviously incorrect answer. 37% of the time, the subject went along with the group, despite the fact that it was obvious that they were wrong. He wanted to conform. Research shows that some people are more susceptible than others, but the, the personality tests are poor predictors of conformity. Researchers discovered that when social influences are weak, then personality is more predictive of behavior and thus conformity. Situation certainly influences whether the individual will dare to a dissent or to conform. Repeating Ash's conformity experiments around the world, researchers have discovered that different cultures have different levels of conformity. 30% conformity, Lebanon, Brazil, and Hong Kong. 51% Bantu tribesmen, tribesmen of Zimbabwe. Possibly the least conforming population were the very individualistic French. An individualism that they are now being crucified for by the conservative U.S. press. Well, we won't worry about what's going on in the press. <laughs> there you go. A stoplight. I actually run into this. This, uh, that's on Route 66 in Texas. <laughs> uh, obedience is a social norm that is valued in every culture. You simply can't have people doing whatever they want all the time. It would result in chaos. Consequently, we are socialized beginning as children to obey authority figures whom we perceive as legitimate. We internalize the social nor uh, norm of obedience such that we usually obey rules and laws even when the authority figure isn't present. You stop at red lights even if the cops aren't around. And of course, that's the road. Okay, so uh, let me explain to you why this stop sign is, stop light is here. <laughs> About a mile down the road, it becomes a single lane highway. But uh, so th what they're doing is they're stopping traffic here uh, going, that's going west, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it's going west. Uh, I can, you can tell from the shadows, uh, that's going west. And then coming east, of course, there, there's a, it's a, a bridge is, they're working on a bridge. Now, why isn't it closer to the bridge? Uh, there's a, there was a reason for that, and I can't remember what it was. Anyway, so you go east, uh, yeah, if, if you're coming, uh, heading east and, and looking east, of course, it's like two miles down the road, so it looks like it's forever. Actually, that's that's the that thing right there is uh, what the, is uh, what they're working on. That's the bridge. Yeah, I was stopped there. <laughs> uh, it looks weird, but it's, you know, they needed to do it. And I can't remember what it was. There was a reason that they had to back it up so far. But I'll tell you what, I sat at that light at, almost all by myself for, uh, I don't know, about 10 minutes. And then a whole lot of traffic came and then it turned green. Atrocities and genocides, Armenian uh, massacre by the Turks during World War I. This has happened over and over and over again. The Ukraine Holodomor. Haldemore in the 1930s by the Stalinist Soviets. The, the 20th century was marked by repeated in Germany and the rest of, the, of Europe during World War II. Uh, Cambodian Khmer Rouge massacre of its own people from 1975 to 1979. Between uh, 1992 and 1995, Muslim Bosnian male civilians were systematically executed while female uh, Muslim civilians were sexually assaulted and raped, uh, tens of thousands of, uh, of them were killed. Uh, Rwandan genocide in 1994 of Tutsi uh, tribesmen by the Hutu government. 
uh, currently, since uh, 2003, half a million Sudanese from South Sudan have died. One of the most important questions facing the world's inhabitants, therefore, becomes where does obedience end and personal responsibility begin? The philosopher Hannah Arendt in 1965 was particularly in interested in understanding the causes of the Holocaust. So we've seen genocides over and over and over and over again. So if you hate a group of individuals, started with the Turks and the Armenians, it didn't start with the Turks and Armenians. It's being, it goes back into human history. And of course, I'm not uh, ignoring the uh, uh, genocide of uh, indigenous peoples in the Americas uh, by the Spanish, by the English, by the, uh, the uh, American uh, government. Um, has uh, the atrocities that they have uh, have in, have done uh, is you know it, it, it you can't ignore that. I can't ignore that. I'm sure you don't want to. How would uh, how could Hitler's Nazi regime in Germany accomplish the murder of six million European Jews? Arendt argued that most uh, participants in the Holocaust were not sadists or psychopaths who enjoyed the mass murder of innocent people, but ordinary citizens subjected to complex and powerful social pressures. She covered the trial of Adolf Eichmann, the Nazi official responsible for the transportation of Jews to the death camps, and concluded that he was not the monster that many people made him out to be, but a commonplace bureaucrat like any other bureaucrat who did what he was told without questioning his orders. How can we be sure that the Holocaust, Mi Lai, and other mass atrocities were not caused solely by evil, psychopathic people, but by powerful social forces operating on people of all types? Stanley Milgram decided to find out in what was to become the most famous series of studies in social psychology. Stanley Milgram wanted to know how, how far people would follow an authority figure. After testing over 1,000 subjects, Milgram discovered that about 65% of the participants were willing to deliver the optimum punishment on the sham experimental subjects. And here's... <clears throat> so what he had, he had... Uh, what happened was he had two people... Two people came into his, uh, into his laboratory. And one person was a confederate, and the other person was the subject. And so what uh, they did, the confederate was the one that lost, and he, was, he, he became the, the uh, subject of this sham experiment. The other individual was put in front of this thing. He was put uh, here. And now each of these little uh, toggle switches uh, it theoretically gives this guy a shock. And so the idea was that uh, you, you, uh, this, the uh, idea of the experiment was that uh, uh, you learn by punishing people. The, if you punish people, they learn faster. That was the idea. So he would ask him a question. If he got it right, then he didn't shock him. If he got it wrong, then he would, he would uh, give him a shock. And every time he shocked him, he went farther. He, it got stronger and stronger and stronger until... It got right to here. That looks like a lot. I don't know. It looks like he had to shock him about 30 times. Milgram discovered that there were four factors to obedience. And this is it. This is what the toggle switch looks like. One, two, three, four, five. I'm not going to count them. Anyway, it looks like a, a real thing. But it wasn't. It was, he was a confederate. He wasn't being shocked. But they wanted to find out how long they would follow their instructions. And as we said before, about 65%. He, he, he did this on a th over 1,000 people. He, at first, he just did it with, with uh, males. And he figured, well, may, you know, women are sugar and spice and everything nice. So he, he uh, did the same experiment with women, got exactly the same results, right at 65%. So Milgram discovered that there were four factors to obedience. First of all, the victim's emotional distance. How, how 
strongly does he feel about this individual in the other room screaming about being electrocuted. The authorities' closeness and legitimacy. Uh, as you can see in most of the experiments, the uh, they were right next to him. Uh, whether or not the authority was institutionalized, uh, they did it at Yale University, and that was the idea. Uh, when they, and they did it uh, actually, they did it uh, off campus and uh, with a different name. Yale wasn't connected to it. It was a sham research uh, organization, uh, and they still got conformity up to forty-three percent. The liberating effects of a disobedient fellow subject. Uh, in other words. Um, if they had somebody else uh, tell them, hey, you don't have to do this, um, if there was another subject that told them that, then, uh, then they were less likely to conform. Emotional distance of the victim, Milgram's subjects acted with the least compassion when the shocked victims could not be seen. When there were no protests from the shocked victim, compliance was almost 100%. When the shock victims were in the same room as the subject, compliance went down to 40%. When the subject had to force the shock victim's hand on the shock plate, the compliance went down to 30%. And that's what's happening here. Of course, if he knows anything about electricity, he should know that if he holds that, oh, I guess maybe that's rubber or something. So he doesn't get shocked. Combat has, has proven that Milgram is correct in his assumptions. The more distant or depersonalized the enemy, the easier it is to kill them. Nations at war will attempt to dehumanize the enemy in order to force their soldiers to kill them. We called uh, the Japanese during World War One or World War Two Japs. We called the Germans Krauts. We called them Heinies. Uh, during uh, the uh, Korean War and the Vietnam War, uh, we referred to the uh, uh, the enemy is gooks and slopes and zipper heads and, and uh, in uh, f fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan, we referred to the enemy as ragheads, camel jockeys, and hajis. At the same time, researchers have found that it is more difficult to abort a pregnancy when the mother has seen an ultrasound of her fetus. Closeness and legitimacy of the authority. Uh, Milgram, I'm sorry, I... S uh, Okay, wait a second. Closest in legitimacy of the authority, Milgram discovered that when the authority figure stayed in the room with the subject, obedience was high. When the authority figure was not in the room, the compliance dropped to 21%. When the authority figure was perceived as illegitimate, compliance dropped by 80%. When doctors order nurses to obey uh, in an experiment that mirrored Milgram, Milgram's, Hoffling had 22 nurses given an order that they knew couldn't possibly be right. 21 of the nurses complied without delay. They were willing to overdose a patient because of the doctor's orders. The experiment was repeated two more times with similar results. So you know, even though that they were giving the, uh, or theoretically they were giving the, the uh, patient uh, a lethal dosage, of drugs, they did it anyway because the doctor ordered them to. Institutional authority because Milgram, that's 48%. Uh, institutional authority because Milgram did his experiments at Yale University, many of his subjects claimed that it was the prestige of the institution that made them comply to such a heinous command. Milgram repeated his, his experiment as an unknown research group in Connecticut. Fewer people complied with the authority, but still 48% did. I said 43% before. I'm sorry. I, ha I haven't taught this class in a couple of years. <laughs> 48%. 48%. That's still almost half. Liberating effect of uh, group de uh, defiance. Uh, Milgram discovered that when the subjects observed others disobeying the authority figure, they were likely to do the same. A full 90% followed the lead of their rebellious colleagues, proving that group influence can be liberating. According to Ash and other researchers, the most conformity that can be generated by a group is when the group is made up of three, four, or five members. The more over five, the less compliance that can be expected. When looking at evidence, a group is more likely to listen to several small groups than one large one. Unanimity, as Ash discovered with his work, it is very difficult to, to be the lone dissenter in a group. 
However, if there is one other dissenter in the group, it is much easier for the second person to also dissent. Experiments show that the two dissenters will actually feel very close and warm to each other. Jesus sent the disciples out in pairs. This is according to Mark 1, uh, 21 through 28. And the Church of Latter-day Saints sends out its missionaries in pairs. Having someone else dissent gives a second dissenter courage to dissent on uh, subsequent examples. Group cohesion. Now, when someone from outside the group dissents, it is more powerful than when someone inside the group dissents. Uh, this may be because we see people in the same group easily following one another, cohesion, knee-jerk reaction, but outside the group, the likelihood of dissent is less strong. In an opposing group, the pressure is to be cohesive. Dissent from the group has much more power against us. Status, the higher the status of an individual, the more impact their opinion will have. Often people will avoid agreeing with low status or stigmatized people. Research in Australia showed that people responded to a well-dressed person better than a poorly dressed individual, both in the jaywalking experiment and the survey experiment. Uh, in the jaywalking experiment, the poorly dressed model actually lowered the percentage of jaywalks because people didn't want to be identified with the poorly dressed individual. And that was what the experiment was. Jaywalking, of course, is against the law. Uh, you're supposed to, to only cross at the corners so that you're protected by the lights. If you cut across traffic, uh, then uh, that's too dangerous. That's the idea anyway. So what they did, they had a well-dressed person jaywalking and they had a poorly dressed person jaywalking. They also had a person that looked like a bum jaywalking. And as you can see, the worst, the, the, the uh, lower status of the dress, the less likely um, that people would jaywalk. The higher the status uh, of the individual, the more likely that it would increase jaywalking. Researchers were interested to find out if subjects were as uh, group-oriented in a private response as when their response is public. Research shows that when the response is public, people feel much more pressure to conform than if they are allowed to express their opinions in a secret ballot. It is easier to express your opinion in private rather than allowing yourself to be held to public ridicule. Um, I live in Iowa. Iowa has caucuses. So the Democrats have a caucus and the Republicans have a caucus. So what happens, all the Democrats get in a big room. Uh, it's, it's really kind of fun. Uh, they get in a big room and uh, they put forth uh, the name of candidates. And if you are in favor of uh, a select candidate, you go over in this corner if you're a Biden supporter. If you're a Kennedy supporter, you go to this corner. If you're, uh, I don't know, there's nobody else running at this point. Uh, but the Republicans will do the same thing. So they'll have DeSantis and Trump and, and Haley, Haley, Nikki Haley, uh, Rama, Ramaswamy. You know, they'll, they'll have a, a corner for each of those individuals. Like the Republicans have like eight people running. Uh, so it really gets to be kind of interesting. You kind of sit there and, and wait until they until they decide to caucus. And at that point, uh, you know, everybody gravitates toward one person or another. Uh, when was it? Uh, who was running? Oh, no, it wasn't Obama. It was Hillary Clinton. Who was Hillary running against? Bernie Sanders? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, uh, we the last <laughs> last time I was able to caucus here, I'll be able to caucus next year probably. I probably won't be in in Arizona. I'll probably be here. I'll probably still be in uh, COVID protocols. Anyway, the last time we uh, uh, caucused. Uh, I caucused for Sanders, and my wife caucused for uh, Clinton, for Hillary Clinton, and uh, it was really kind of interesting. She's standing over there, and I'm standing over here, and she's arguing about. Well, I, then they gave we we gave speeches, so that was kind of interesting. Arguing with my wife.
with you know in a, in a room full of two hundred people. <laughs> Uh, in public. Prior commitment, anyone who has ever per, uh, uh, participated in a sporting event where there are judges, umpires, or referees knows that once an official makes a decision on a play, they very rarely will change their mind, even if they are obviously wrong. Researchers have discovered that once an individual makes a, a public decision, they very rarely recant their decision, even under overwhelming social pressure. Hence, arguing with an official may only steal their heart against you. The best course is uh, to not uh, set the official up for social ridicule. If you set him up for social ridicule, you're not going to get a call the rest of the game. As many parents have discovered, challenging a child's behavior can sometimes lead to the child acting in the opposite manner to exert their freedom and individuality. This is known as reactance, acting to protect our sense of freedom. Parents can limit this type of reaction from their children by offering them choices instead of commands. And maybe we can do that with in politics, too. Um, researchers in Canada have found that it may be the laws against underage drinking that lead as much uh, to, to as much underage drinking as there is. A survey in 1997 found that while a whopping 69% of 21 to 24-year-olds had been drunk at least once the year before, 77% of those 18 to 20 had been drunk the year before. A similar study in the United States college campuses showed 75% drinking rate for those of age, but an 81% drinking rate for those under 21. There you go. That's what it looks like to be drunk. That's not his shoe. Well, maybe he's got his socks on. Yeah, oh, he's gone. <laughs> there's, there's a shoe. Well, maybe it's somebody else's shoe. Uh, anyway. Further research into teenage drinking by Ruth Engs and David uh, Hansen in 1989 showed that while 15% of legal age students are heavy drinkers, 24% of underage students are heavy drinkers. Just as the preacher's kid is the wildest and the Catholic school girls are, girls are reputed to be the most sexually active, rampant alcohol and drug use among teenagers may be a reactance against, re, re, against restrictions. There you go. Uh, let's drink that Coors. While people are pressured to conform by their dominant group, they also seek uniqueness. People will go to great ends to declare their uniqueness, from hairstyles to body piercing and body art. When asked who they are, people tend to point out their differences from the norm rather than chronicle their similarities. When a minority of any kind, uh, that aspect seems to stick out like a sore thumb. In Korea, when I was there, I, my, my wife was stationed in Korea for a year, and I went to visit her. Uh, about six months into the tour, uh, and my hair is, is, as you may may or may not know, <laughs> is gray. <laughs> this was how long ago? This was 30 years ago. My hair still was gray. The Koreans have very dark hair. They have black hair uh, to an individual. There's, they don't even have redheads that I saw. They may dye their hair now, but at that time when we were in Korea, this was 94, I think. Yeah, 94. Anyway, uh, when I was there, I was like the only gray-headed person in the whole country. So people kept giving me things. They would, uh, um, we were out um, at a um, temple and uh, it started to rain and this guy gave me his umbrella. It was, it was a, it was made out of bamboo with uh, a garbage bag strung, strung across the bamboo. But I, it was ch a cheap umbrella. But at least you know he gave me his umbrella. That was really nice of him. Uh, somebody gave us a ride. It started raining really hard. Korea's on the uh, ocean, so they get a lot of strange and strong weather. Anyway, yeah, my gray hair set me apart from everybody else. Ooh, there you go. That's what you want in your armpit. It's 
quite a tattoo. <laughs> I think that's a probably, I don't know. Oh, there you go. He saw. That's a lot of ink. And that's a lot of ink. With a split tongue and, and the pointed teeth. Okay. There we go. Oh, no, he's got his eye closed. Oh. Wow. I don't know. <clears throat> there you go. <clears throat> it's a lot of metal. Looks like my niece. That's a lot of metal. My uh, nephew uh, did that to his ears. They, he's he's let them grow back now, but uh, he kept putting plugs in his ears. He didn't do that to his lip, though. Man. Ooh, there you go. That's what you need. Bumps in your head. 666. Okay. Interesting idea. That makes him unique. This lady's actually a lawyer. In London. She's got the lumps, too. <clears throat> okay, well, there you go. Unique people. Everybody wants to look different. Uh, so I'll talk to you again next week. Chapter 9 next week.